Well, um, a little bit of cleanup after the last one. I was going to talk just about, let me see, five myths, I think. Um, if you're interested in myths about the Crusades, and there are a lot of them out there, um, I wrote an article for Intercollegiate Review in 2011 that discussed four myths uh, about the Crusades, and I also wrote the chapter that I told you about in the book Seven Myths of the Crusades that talks about the idea that the Crusades are unprovoked and explains in probably boring detail that that's not true. Uh, the detail, the, the, the source documentation of the fact that Islam had been attacking the Christian world for 450 years approximately before the Crusades is just overwhelming. You can't look at it and deny it. It's not intellectually honest to deny it, but there's a lot of denial going on all the same. So here are some of the myths. There's a myth, and you've probably heard these, that the Crusades were populated by bored younger sons. I've seen uh, there were historians in the past who said, well, the thing that caused the Crusades uh, is the shift from partible inheritance uh, to primogeniture. That is a shift from the way property was inherited from father to son, whereas the Mer Merovingians um, inherited property by dividing up the property by the number of surviving sons. If there are five sons, the father's lordship gets divided in five. You do that over several generations and the lordships are teeny weeny. And the idea was, uh, well, that left all the young sons something to do, but then when people decided to go to primogeniture, which is only the oldest son inherits, um, that was great because it kept the lordships together, but it meant that all those other four sons had nothing to do, and they got bored and looked at each other and said, hey, let's go kill Muslims, and went off on crusade. I have actually seen that argument made in approximately that level of crudity, and it's flat wrong. It's flat wrong. Uh, in fact, what happened, and the great crusade historian from Cambridge University, Jonathan Riley Smith, has pretty clearly demonstrated this from some very detailed and extensive studies in source documents. There were great French noble families that pretty quickly in the Crusades decided that looking after the Holy Land was one of their responsibilities as a family, as a noble family. And it wasn't the younger sons that led their participation in the Crusades. Very often it was the Lord himself, the Count, the Duke, uh, whoever it was. And they would go generation after generation after generation, and many times uh, they wouldn't come back. And the lordship would have to be taken over by the next generation, and then he'd go and not come back. Uh, so it wasn't a question of bored younger sons going and beating up on people. Uh, it was more a question of certain noble French families developing a sense of responsibility for the Christian East. And that's demonstrable from the sources. Um, there's the idea that they wanted to go get rich. Let's go off and make our fortune, take over other people's countries and take their stuff and be rich. Um, remember the casualty rate I told you from the First Crusade? It's a debate about 70%. Uh, it's not a question of getting rich as much as it is a question of getting dead. Uh, the motivation is spiritual riches, not uh, material riches. That is not to say that there weren't people who did get rich, and that has confused uh, some later observers of the Crusades. Uh, some of the participants on the First Crusade did set up counties and principality, a, a principality and a kingdom. That's four of them, four total. Uh, and once they're set up, then you can't go to the east and set your own up because there's already one there. People are not going to get rich, they're not going to get powerful. Um, on average, it's very difficult to transfer money values from the past into modern money values. But just as a rough rule of thumb, um, in 2019 money, it cost approximately $350,000 for a night to go on crusade. $350,000. Um, Madeline, do you have 350000 lying around? No, you, you don't, you don't. Darn it. George, how about you? No. Um, guess what? Me neither. <laughs> what would most Americans have to do if they were told they needed to raise $350,000? Get a sponsor. That, yeah, get a sponsor. That's right. There's another thing you could do. You could sell all your property. Sell all your property. Mortgage your house, right? A lot of us have houses that are probably worth maybe at least half that. 
Um, that'll get you a start. And that's exactly what they did. They got a sponsor or they mortgaged or sold their property. Um, in general, medieval lords were pathologically allergic to permanently alienating possessions of the family, to selling property. They just did not want to do it. But there were counts in northern France who sold their counties in order to go on crusade. That's an indication of their seriousness about what they're doing. There's also the idea, and I kind of alluded to it before, oh, let's go out and kill uh, a bunch of, of other, you know, that idea, the, the idea of the other. And, and these terrible white Europeans hate people that don't look like them. Maybe their skin pigmentation is a little darker or something. Well, number one, medieval people generally did not think about race that way. Um, our understanding of race is colored by a number of things that happened since the Middle Ages. One of those things is Charles Darwin and his theories of evolution, uh, which led to the idea that some races were less or more evolved than others, and medieval people didn't have that idea. Um, in general, and there are of course exceptions to this, medieval people were much more care caring, much more interested in what you believed and whose side you were on than what you looked like. Uh, you're a Jew, you're a Muslim, you convert to Christianity, okay, now you're a Christian, you're one of us. Um, one of the recurring legends, myths, things that fascinated the medieval mind, particularly those people who were interested in, in the Holy Land, interested in the East, um, they had a legend of a king that they called Prester John. There was this idea he was off somewhere in the distance and he was a great powerful monarch in an alien land and they, someday we will find him and he will pull our irons out of the fire. <coughs> and they knew enough about what they were talking about to be basically pointing either in the direction of Ethiopia or India. Uh, so these are not people that are going to look like Saxons. And that didn't affect their longing for the guy to show up and help them out and be their friend in the least. They thought he was going to be wonderful. There wasn't ever actually a Prester John. Uh, but the myth was probably fueled either by Ethiopia or by ideas of Indian Christians, probably Ethiopia. Um, they, it's just simply not a question of racism. Uh, people get so confused about that. Um, there was an instance where I was talking to a Canadian graduate student a few years ago, and he was bad-mouthing Americans and talking about how racist Americans are because, you know, the way they treat Muslims. And I listened to him until I couldn't take it anymore, and I finally said, you know, Islam isn't a race, it's a religion. I could be a Muslim. What would stop me from being a Muslim? Nothing. I can be a Muslim. I mentioned Baibars. He was a Kipchak Turk. He was a Caucasian. He had, by all accounts, I think he was the one that had rather reddish hair, and he's probably whiter than I am, uh, except when I'm feeling ill. Uh, th this is not a question of race. That's, that's a ridiculous red herring. There's the myth that it was unprovoked. Well, we've all already kind of dealt with that. Um, how long do you have to be attacked before you are legitimately provoked? Is 450 years enough? Is two-thirds of your holdings enough to consider be considered provocation? Um, in the 10th, 10th or 11th century, uh, a, there was a Muslim pirate nest set up on the coast of southern France. And they preyed on travelers crossing the Alps, the passes in the Alps. And at one point, they captured the abbot of Cluny, which was the foremost Benedictine abbey in, in Western Europe. Is that a provocation? Does that count? Or does it, I mean, what does it take to be an adequate provocation? They certainly were provoked. There's a myth that uh, the Crusaders were all wild-eyed nut jobs that thought that if they would take Jerusalem, they would make Jesus come back. It provoked the second coming. Millennialism is the term for that. And it was kind of a popular theory about 20 years ago when we had a little bit of a thing about a millennium coming up and everybody got kind of weird about it. Um, certainly there were people who, because of their, perhaps, perhaps because of their sacramental view of reality, they, um, how do I want to say this, thought that Jerusalem was not only an earthly city but also a link to heaven and that God wanted Jerusalem to be held by Christians and that he wasn't coming back in the second coming because Christians had failed to hold the city and keep impurity, non-Christians, out of it. There were people who thought that. There certainly were. It wasn't all that uh, minority of an opinion, but it's also not what caused the Crusades. Yeah. My impression is that millennial or dispensationalist is probably slightly different. Yeah, that is different. Is uh, relatively recent. Dispensational is 19th century. 
Yes, okay. correct. What we're talking about is the idea that in the year 1000, it having been a thousand years after uh, okay. the birth of Christ, that he should come back. And just as there were people kind of weird about the year 2000, there were people kind of weird about the year 1000. And they did think, they were thinking, okay, it's time for him to come back. And then when he didn't, there were people that said, why didn't he? He should have. Yeah. What are we doing wrong? It must be that we have not kept the holy places pure. Mm -hmm. There were people that said that. That's different from dispensationalism. Yeah. Uh, a different meaning of the word mil millennialism, actually. Same word, different meaning, different context. Um, there's a historian who has specialized in millennialism, Richard Landis is his name, and he's in many ways he's a very good historian. Um, he put forward this idea that the Crusades were significantly stimulated by millennialism, um, and it hasn't been widely accepted because, frankly, I think he's wrong. <laughs> yeah, it's there, it's an element, it's not a very big element. Yeah. You can probably think of some other myths. Uh, if you think of some things and you wonder if they're myths, write them down in your notes and we'll talk about them when we get done. Any comments or questions about that before we start talking about the military orders and the Templars? How many of you ever saw the movie or read the book, The Name of the Rose? Go ahead. Go ahead. I know you don't think uh, the idea of primogeniture played a large role, but would you think it perhaps played a larger role with the British and Spanish expansions in the 16th and 17th centuries of their empires? I'm going to take the cheap route out on that one and tell you that I'm a medieval historian and that my opinion on that point wouldn't be very valuable. <laughs> I don't think I know enough of what I'm talking about to be allowed an opinion there, and I try not to talk when I'm pretty sure I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Are you picking the concept, though, just that there's a, the, the sons have to go find their own world? And like running the empire in India or something. Okay. Yeah. Um, just off the top of my head, my instinct would be that that might have played a role, but it's not a very informed... I have not read the sources there, so you really shouldn't pay much attention to what my instincts are on that point. Yeah, you didn't uh, mention this in the talk, but uh, I've heard that there was some sort of Ninth Crusade. Well, that's a numbering issue. Some people will call what I call the Eighth the Ninth. Okay, then what was the extra? I forget. It depends on who's talking about it. Those are all modern creations, those numbers. Yeah, they're all post-medieval, post those numbers. Um, it depends on who's number. Sometimes people will call the what I call the seventh the sixth and what I call the eighth the seventh because they don't count Frederick II's crusade a crusade because he was excommunicated and he didn't fight. It, it just doesn't look like the others. Um, I was fortunate enough to hear a paper at a conference about three, four years ago that laid out the way this convention for numbering the Crusades has evolved. And I wish I could ever get it, my hands on a printed, published copy of that paper because it was really good. But it's modern history. It's looking at the early modern period and later to see the numbering. Remember, they mostly don't call them Crusades, and they're certainly not giving them those numbers. That's our crutch to help us understand. Sometimes it gets in the way of understanding. 